I'm Katie Borkman, K6KDB, an amateur radio operator, instructional designer, and philosophy professor, primarily a 100% online philosophy instructor. And this little presentation is going to be about a very interesting event that took place on December 6, 2012 with the Klein School, Costa Mesa, and the International Space Station. NASA and the American Radio Relay League sponsor a really interesting project that involves students having the opportunity to be able to ask specific technical questions of astronauts as they're orbiting in space. In what follows, I hope to give you a somewhat detailed explanation of how that happens and what it's all about and a brief history of both ARISS, Amateur Radio Board the ISS, and SARIX, the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment that took place in the 90s. This is a brief presentation on the Klein School and the Amateur Radio Board, the ISS, experiment on December 6, 2012. Thanks to Charlie Safana, AJ9N, the control operator for this particular mission. I'm KD Borkman, K6KDB, and I was the on-site amateur radio operator. This can truly be described as an adventure in amateur radio communications. First of all, kudos to the Klein School. After a year and a half of preparations, NASA accepted the Klein School application. All of the students were busily prepared in learning more about space, about astronautics, about life aboard the International Space Station, so that they'd be able to ask meaningful questions during their telebridge operations. What is ARISS? ARISS stands for Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. We should probably talk a little bit about what amateur radio is. Some people confuse it with other services. Amateur radio, which is also called ham radio, is a use of designated radio frequency spectrums for purposes of private recreation, non-commercial exchange of messages, wireless experimentation, self-training, and emergency communication. And while amateur radio operators constantly experiment with connecting their signals up to the Internet, amateur radio so far is mostly wireless. You do need a license to be able to become an amateur radio operator and also be able to operate on the radio spectrum. In countries that license citizens to use amateur radio, the operators are required to display some knowledge and understanding of key concepts. The Morse code, many people would be happy to hear, is no longer required. But here's an example that you probably would know even if you've never studied Morse code. Yes, that's something you pr pretty much do not want to play with because if you send it out over the air, it's like crying f uh, fire in a crowded room. Before the amateur radio aboard the ISS project, there was the shuttle amateur radio experiment, which is very similar, except the amateur radio operator would be aboard the space shuttle. The very first time an amateur radio operator went into space, named Owen Garriott, whose call sign was W5LFL, was when the first SARX shuttle amateur radio experiment took place. And it was a predecessor, predecessor to ARISS. Here's some audio from that historic mission. I'm sure you can imagine how exciting it was for the very first effort ever made to attempt contact for those of us who are laypersons on the ground but have amateur radio licenses with an amateur radio operator aboard the shuttle. Klein School's experience with the shuttle amateur radio experiment goes back to 1994 with astronaut Robert Cabana, commander aboard the Columbia. His call sign was K65HBV, 
and the Klein School had a successful contact that was acknowledged by the astronauts in the form of a giant poster that was sent commemorating the event to the Klein School. The very last shuttle amateur radio experiment was conducted in 1999 when it was brought to a close and two interesting things about this particular mission should be noteworthy. First of all, it was the last SAR-X mission as mentioned. Secondly, the commander, Eileen Collins, KD-5EDS on the STS-93, was the first ever shuttle commander who was a female. Now what is a telebridge? What is the difference between a direct contact with the International Space Station and a telebridge contact? During all the amateur radio aboard the ISS contacts, the astronauts use amateur radio station equipment that is connected up to the International Space Station apparatus. For a direct contact, an amateur radio station is set up at a specific location and provides a direct radio link to the space station. And of course what this requires is some fairly sophisticated software programs, the appropriate kind of equipment like circularly polarized antennas, altazimuth rotators, and pretty much constant attention to what's going on with regard to the location and the attitude of the ISS. For a telebridge contact, by contrast, an amateur radio ground station is located somewhere in the world. In the case of the Klein School for this particular mission, it was located in Italy. That station makes the radio link to the shuttle, or the ISS. And one would use an ordinary telephone line to connect to the ground station, and then it would be patched in to the amateur radio equipment, and subsequently transmitted to the ISS astronauts. The link for the Klein School was through IK-1 SLD, Claudio, in Italy. And of course what happened there was our signal was transmitted via the telephone line to Italy and then uplinked to the ISS. For the Klein School Telebridge, the International Space Station would be passing over our contact station in Rome. From Rome, our signal would be patched to the astronauts aboard the International Space Station, and then their signal in turn would be patched through Rome and the Telebridge, and then on to the Klein School in Costa Mesa. In the case of the Klein School, we talked to, which is to say in amateur radio lingo, we had a CUSO with OR4 ISS and Commander Kevin Ford aboard the International Space Station. Some fun facts. The International Space Station orbit is between 200 and 250 miles above the Earth. People frequently ask, how fast is it going? approximately 17,500 miles per hour. This explains why it takes approximately 90 minutes to orbit the Earth. Currently the ISS has Expedition 34 that is hosting and at the time at which we spoke to Commander Ford there were three of the six Expedition members aboard the ISS. Madelta Channel 46, Telebridge Station calling for you, Kevin. Do you copy, over? IK-1 SLD, OR-4 ISS on channel 46. Okay, channel 46, uh, are you ready for the first question? Kevin, over. Oscar Romo 4, India Sierra Sierra, New Year India Kilo 1 Sierra Lima Delta, channel 46. We're on channel 46, Cindy Kilo 1, Sierra Lima Delta, this is 04 ISS, loud and clear on channel 46, over. 
Okay, are you ready for first question, please? Third coin. My name is Maddie. Were you already a ham operator before going into space, or did you learn so you could become a part of the AERIS program? Over. No, I was not a ham operator in training for this mission. I had a radio permit for other types of radios, but not for ham radios. But we had to study and take the test and become ham operators uh, just like other ham operators do. Over. My name is Brandon. How do you reposition the ISS if you need to change its orbit or dodge some space junk? Over. Big question. Well, the most effective way we change our path is we fire our thrusters on the Russian segment in the same direction that we're moving in. If we add two feet per second of velocity to our space station, then it boosts our altitude in the orbit on the other side by over a mile high. So by knowing where the collision is going to be closest to where the collision might occur, we change our velocity just to point to miss the debris in our orbit. Over. My name is Isaac. Are you permitted to move about the space station at will, or do some areas require clearance? Over. Isaac, we can go anywhere in the space station that we want to at any time. No clearance required anywhere. It's international, and it's really nice. Of course, uh, we would need special permission to go outside the space station. Over. My name is Evan. Is there a math concept that, when you were learning it, you said, what will I ever use this for, that you now find yourself using regularly aboard the space station? Over. Well, I remember learning trigonometry and some types of algebra and wondering about those, but all of our orbits are all about angles and sines and cosines and circles, so our flight path around the Earth is made up of those things and combinations of them, so it's very important to me every day. Also, calculus is essential to space flight. We couldn't fly in space without it. And I don't use it, but Mission Control uses it every single day for us. Over. My name is Samara. What specialized training do you receive to prepare for EVAs? Over. Tomorrow we have to learn how to use every tool that we might use outside, how to work in our spacesuit, which is very complicated. The spacesuit is like a little spacecraft that has air and cooling, electrical systems, communication systems, and a little jet pack in case we come loose from the space station. Um, also, we practice spacewalking underneath the water so that we can float in any orientation, just like we're in space. Over. My name is Tyler. If you were able to see the solar eclipse on November 13, 14, what did it look like? Over. Well, we tried to see it, Tyler, but we couldn't. They told us it would be a big dark splotch on the ground in the distance, like a shadow, but we uh, really wanted to see it, but we couldn't. Over. My name is Rishi. Are any aircraft within the Earth's atmosphere visible? And if so, is this of any value? Over. Well, I haven't actually seen any aircraft, but you can see their contrails that they leave behind. It's valuable to us somewhat because you can tell when you're over continents in major cities. If you see a lot of them below you, you know you're somewhere near civilization. Over. My name is Elias. As we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the last lunar landing mission, Apollo 17, what achievements do you anticipate us celebrating 40 years from now? Over. Well, I think we'll be back on the moon with a habitation there. I hope the United States is part of the team because somebody in the world will do it. Um, perhaps we'll also have the technology to get to Mars quickly and start exploring there too. And maybe it won't take 40 years. Maybe it will just be 20. Who knows? Over. My name is Aviv. When you work on projects with astronauts from other countries, do the language differences cause any problems? Over. Well, sometimes it does, but we all study languages and and uh, be be uh, capable of speaking with each other. We have to be very careful. Um, usually when I talk to my cosmonaut crewmates, I speak Russian if I can, and then when they speak to me, they use English, and that works out pretty good. Over. My name is Sergey. In your free... Have you ever made an important accidental discovery? Over. Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. I make mistakes and learn little things all the time. The other day I went to smell some Russian shampoo before I used it. And the bottle was just about empty. I had a little bit stuck in the bottom, so I held it under my nose and gave it a little squeeze. But there was some shampoo trapped in the top underneath the cap, so it shot up into my nose. That wasn't very good. 
who climbs right up into the caps of bottles in zero gravity and likes to hide there. Over. <laughs> My name is Mary Grace. What is the emergency medical plan for a serious illness or injury? Over. We have a lot of training before we come up here, Mary Grace. Uh, first we give it first aid, we can give CPR if we need it. We have a defibrillator on board to use if it's required. And then we have doctors on the ground to help us with anything that we might need to do that's special. If it's really serious, we have a serious spacecraft. We could just jump in it, fly it home. It's kind of like our life code. Over. My name is Alan. Is it difficult to readjust to walking in one year on Earth after months in microgravity? Over. Yeah, very difficult. After my space shuttle flight, I had to really concentrate on not falling over almost <laughs> for almost the whole day afterwards. So we had specialists on the ground to help us with our rehabilitation after we landed. Over. My name is Maddie. Are you able to see shooting stars? Over. Yes, you can see shooting stars from the space station. Um, there's some upcoming opportunities. I'm going to go look out the window and see if I can see some. It's really interesting here because remember the atmosphere is below us, so we see the shooting stars coming into the atmosphere below us instead of above us, like you do. Over. My name is Brandon. Do the 30 second periods of weightlessness aboard the Vomit Comet adequately prepare you for long durations of microgravity? Over. They help a lot, but not completely, because the hard part is doing everyday tasks without the ground to provide your support, something to stand on and push against. That is what makes space fly hard, and we don't get to practice that too much in the Vomit Comet. Also, the short periods on the plane don't cause any bone or muscle problems like the long space flight does. My name is Isaac. If you could write your own space mission, what would it be? Over. Well, I think I'm kind of living a great one right now. Five months in weightlessness in outer space. But if I could pick my very favorite thing to do, I would think I would like to go there and land near a habitation module and a moon lander, spend a few weeks there, and then come back home again to Earth. I think it would really be fun being in lunar gravity and, and making that trip to and from the moon. Over. One minute. Well, thank you so much, Commander Ford, for spending your time with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you also for helping us celebrate the 40th anniversary of the last lunar mission. Thank you. Over. Thank you for you today in California, and thanks, Italy, for passing us through. And uh, it's great to have you all on board the space station with me. You have a great day. Over. to uh, give a big shout out and thank you to Claudio from here at Klein School. Grazie amico mio. Grazie, grazie a voi. Okay, Charlie and the school, thank you to all people involved in the contact today for the beautiful work in Costa Mesa and the beautiful equipment at school. From Italy, we sent you our best greetings. 
Good afternoon and ciao ciao from India, Kilo One, Sierra Lima Delta, Claudio and Max, uh, India Whiskey One, Charlie November Fox uh, here in the shack. Ciao ciao. And of course another one goes to Mr. Charlie Sufana who has walked us step by step through this whole ordeal. Thank you, Charlie. I'll be contacting you all a little bit later with some other fun stuff to follow up on, including getting a QSL card. So uh, congratulations once again now. Party Artie. Thanks again, Charlie. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Kenneth, you still there too? Okay. Okay. Close it down here. Are we good, Charlie? Do you have more for us? What's your name? And one last thank you to anyone out there who was with us streaming who may still happen to be with us. Thank you.